Hi all, this is Will from LangChain. Today I'm going to walk through how to create plan and execute style agents in LangGraph. For those of you not familiar with LangGraph, we've got a great set of videos on YouTube that you can go through to get a little more of an introduction, but a short summary of it would be that it's a framework built on top of LangChain Core that provides a graph-based syntax that gives you a great balance between expressivity and control when building things like agents and state machines that require loop type workflows. Um, you can go and you can install it here and check out the repo um, in the Langchain AI organization in GitHub. I'm particularly excited about this video because plan and execute style agents bring agents a step closer to being production ready in general. They can help you have faster execution time, lower token costs, and overall have the promise to have better reliability relative to previous generations of agents. Um, I guess before we jump too far ahead, we'll go give a brief background on some of LLM agents um, by using React as an example. So a little over a year and a half ago, I guess now, um, Shen Yu Yao from Princeton proposed the React paper, which stands for Reasoning in Action, uh, because of the way it prompts language models to reason about the types of things that it needs to do, uh, and then output an action that will then be parsed and put into other software in order to take actions in the real world. And so in this way, the language model can power an agent in a situated environment, such as a web browser or um, another application, and take those actions. So um, this is an example of the prompt of a React agent. It has a place for it to be updating its observations from previous steps. You have different tools it's provided, and um, it'll output the next action. So it'll action or um, search, and then it will pick the highest scoring offensive player in the NFL, for instance, given my input question. Um, and then after a time, it decides that it has the, enough information to respond and will respond directly to the final user. This works often, and it, it, it exposes uh, a really powerful capability of LLMs that wasn't originally um, thought of. However, it has some limitations. For one, it, it requires an LLM for each tool invocation, and so these serial execution can take a lot of time. Um, second, it's only doing one step at a time, and so it's possible that the LLM could be short-sighted and pick a, a next step that makes some sense, but that doesn't actually um, get us all the way to um, the, the output in a very strategic or, or efficient manner. Um, and then uh, there's some other, other um, potential limitations in that it can't do parallel calls and stuff like that. So um, it works in, in some cases, but isn't super um, fast relative to what we have today. Um, to, to address this, a Design pattern for agents has been proposed by a number of people um, over the past year or so uh, for a, a plan and execute style. And so it breaks down agents into a couple of main modules. Um, one is the planner. So the, the, the first step is to take the user input and then whatever additional environmental cues you might have, and then generate a plan of the steps it needs to take in order to obtain the in information required or in order to take actions to bring the environment to the desired state. Um, once it generates those tasks, you'll have particular um, like executors or other types of functionality in order to execute that task. And then optionally, you'll have a step that can choose to replan. And this is the looping logic that it often characterizes an agent. Um, this paper, uh, or this, this example that we have here, the plan and execute example, is based largely on the plan and solve paper here by, um, let's see, not long at all. Um, and it's also based a little bit on, on the baby AGI project from um, Yohei Nakajima. Um, it's pretty simple. In this example, we'll run through, you uh, first populate with your OpenAI key, your Tavli API key, which is the search engine, and we'll go and set up tracing with Langsmith, and that helps you really debug and observe all the choices that the agent makes over the, the course of its trajectory as it's trying to solve the task. So you can really drill down and see how efficient it's being over time. And you'll just create the tools, uh, and then you'll pull from the the, the prompt and create the uh, the agent itself. So in our case, the main components again are the planner, replanner, and the tool executors. Um, this first bit is the agent that we're going to be creating, uh, and this is the actual execution agent. So after the planner has created the task list, it subdivides it so it can divide and conquer. And then for each task, this execution agent will then be taking that and try to use whatever tool it's provided in order to answer the question. Um, so I can create that. You've got the agent executor, and you can invoke it there and do um, whatever. So this is an example. Who's the winner of the US Open? Um, we're just going to give it, let's see, we gave it the search engine so we can see if it can come with an answer there. While that's running, 
um, you can show the, the line graph state. So again, if you're familiar with line graph or the state graph within line graph, each node represents a module. So you can have one for the planner, one for the executor, one for the solver. Um, each node receives the state whenever it's invoked. And the response of that node then is up, used to update the state. And this is how the, the graph then proceeds through its computation. Um, as you can see, it's a state machine. In our case, we have a few different things. We, we have the input, we have the plan that the vendor generates. We have the past states, which are populated. Um, this annotation, annotated um, means that any response is just appended to this list here. Uh, we, we take that annotated syntax um, as a, a way to define how the state is updated. And there's the final response, which is populated by the solver there. Um, we will create a structured output runnable, which again, we'll use function calling or tool calling from OpenAI to populate a pedantic uh, object directly from um, the user input. So we've got this prompt saying it needs to come up with a simple plan. Um, we parse it as steps. So there's just a list of steps. Again, this is just a way of connecting with a fine-tuned model that OpenAI has fine-tuned to generate code as structured output. And then we have this parser, which will then put it in there. And it's a pretty reliable way of parsing the output. Um, so you can generate the plan there. And then the replan step. So if it isn't able to completely accomplish the intended goal in the first step, we will prompt a re uh, replanner, which has the uh, objective, the original plan, past steps, and like all the results from those. And then it is tasked with updating the plan um, or responding. So you can do that. We'll populate it with this LLM. And again, the um, yeah, the prompt there and it's two choices of tools so it can either respond or it can plan and again since this model that open air has developed is fine-tuned on code generation it's pretty good at outputting structured syntax and we parse them into these pedantic objects which makes it easier to maintain within your existing software stack finally now that we've defined um, all these primitives we can create the graph so we'll have one node that executes the steps one that plans and one that replans, and then this conditional edge that decides whether it should end or not. Um, so all of these, and these can be asynchronous or it can be synchronous as well, kind of depends on the performance characteristics you want. The, uh, yeah, so, so we first, we create this workflow and we define it with this plan execute state that we defined above. And then um, we add each node, which as I mentioned before, is the different modules. And then we define how those modules are connected. So after each node, uh, it, is called, we can either say that there's a specific, like a, an edge from that node to another one, which means it will always progress and the state will always pass the next node. Or we can add this conditional edge, which means that given whether this uh, should end function is called, um, basically after, after a node replan is called, should end is called, and then that will determine whether the output should um, end or whether it should go back to the agent here. So this is just a way of having conditional logic of passing the computation between nodes. Um, finally, we can actually call this. So in this case, we have this configuration that sets a recursion limit. This is basically a cap on the number of steps we let the agent take. You could set this to an arbitrarily large number, um, but in general, we'd recommend that you keep it um, within some reason since um, most use cases are relatively time sensitive and you don't want to be continuously calling an LLM if it gets stuck to a loop. Um, and then here's the input to it. So we can stream the outputs and then we'll say if it is the end event, we'll actually print out the full uh, end object here. So here's like a plan um, and we'll watch it progress there. Since I turned on streaming, we can actually then go to the uh, this project here, so we can put up in Langsmith, and you can see as it continues to execute all these series of steps it's making. So we're printing it out in the notebook, but you can also see, see all these nodes in the graph, and you can see all of them. So you can see there's a lot of steps that LangGraph um, obfuscates for you, but you can see the most important ones here, and you can see, for instance, here's the planner. Um, you can see that it called this tool, which returns a bunch of information about the 2024 Australian Open. Um, you can see that it is going to be choosing, or it, it's able to su summarize that, and then it goes here, and this is a response, um, and so it outputs a, a new plan, so it's looking more about the like, hometown and all these types of things, so it's giving more of a background into it, and so if you think that this is being too verbose, you can then look into the different prompts that these are using, 
and modify those using the playground if you want. Um, I won't get too far into that, so we have plenty of examples there. And I want to get on to our other examples, but I think it's a great way of just tracking how the agent's progressing through the lane graph there. So it looks like it actually hit the recursion limit in this case, um, and so I could update the prompts to try to make it make sure that it's not getting too um, uh, verbose in, in its research. We can say that it keep it as efficient as possible, and um, that'll make it be a little bit more effective there. Um, I'm going to go on to the next one now, which is this reasoning without observation paper by Xu et al. So if you recall in the React paper, the limitation was that it called an LLM on every step. And that is pretty slow and it's expensive since you're involving an LLM call and sending this re redundant prefix so you have the system prompt and everything at the beginning. Um, then in the plan and execute paper, the plan and solve paper, we solved a bit of that by saying, let's generate a task list here and then we can execute those things uh, accordingly. The problem is that task list was also just a list of strings and there wasn't any sort of uh, variable substitution or anything there. So it just took it and um, had to had the, the tools called in se sequence and then um, had this response and the replanner was tasked with deciding, oh, now do I need to generate more information now that I've actually received um, answers to my first questions there in the plan. Uh, reasoning without observation goes a step further and allows variable substitution. So the initial plan can actually include a search for the first step and then include information from that search in the second step without actually having to consult the planner again. Um, this, of course, saves you a lot of time because you don't have to involve an LLM at every step and um, lets you actually go all the way to, to completion uh, without having to replan in, in many cases, so long as the tool responses re result in a reasonable um, output. Uh, this is a diagram of the overall graph that we're going to create. So you can see the main components. Again, our planner, you have this worker, which again executes the, the tasks in sequence, and a solver, which takes those results and then responds to the user directly. Um, you can see, we'll see like a, a trace later about this. For all these examples, we'll give it a similar tool. So we'll have this Tavoli search engine tool. You could replace with any search engine. It's more of a, a demonstration of how the agent works that we're going for. Uh, and we'll also set up lang chain tracing just so we can get a nice um, in-depth uh, observation and trace of how the agent's working so that we can debug different things if they do arise. Um, in this case, our state for the graph includes the task, the planning string, um, so these are for the task execution node, um, the steps that were proposed, any results from uh, the, the uh, task execution. So again, since we have variable substitution, uh, th this will be populated with those results so that you can then use it to replace those variables in later values and the final result. Um, maybe I'll dive a little bit more into the format of the prompt here. Or I can see here the, um, the format for the planner is output the plan, which is similar to the reasoning step to the React agent. And this says, like search for information about Henchata. So it's, it's a, an ability to do some chain of thought reasoning and improve the likelihood that its plan is going to be um, performed better. It then assigns variables to each of these tool calls. So say like uh, the pound E1 for search Wikipedia for the Henchata. Um, it also is always given this LLM call. And I found this to be an interesting design decision. It basically is used to get around the fact that the outputs of a lot of these tools aren't like need to be additionally formatted for uh, like subsequent calls, or you might want to be in, well, including some additional reasoning steps in there without having to go back to the planner. While this is still an additional LLM call, since it's more scoped, presumably you can use a, a faster or, or cheaper LLM than what you would use for the planner. So you might use GPT-4 or whatever next version of that in the planner, and then with each uh, LLM call, you might do 3.5 or an open source model or something like that. Um, so you can still get some performance gains there. Uh, I'll skip over the worker and solver for now since we'll talk about that later, but suffice to say the planner here takes this prompt and then outputs a plan using this format. Pretty straightforward. The executor then takes the tasks and, um, and will execute the tool directly. So you can see basically we'll get the current task from the state. And so this basically looks at the results and then returns the information there. Um, it then looks at the steps, which again was that regex output from above and goes through uh, the, the results that we have so far. And if we have an instance of that variable, we'll replace it with the actual output. 
Um, so if I did a search originally and then you have pound E2, hashtag E2, um, you'll then like replace that within the string so that that later tool call can use that information from previous steps in its output. Um, and then you can see we're doing this lookup for our search engine and LLM. And you can add other tools here if you want. I believe in the paper they tested up to 20 tools and said that it worked okay. But um, as we know from this and other studies, if you have too many tools, the quality, it, it often serves to distract the LLM. It uses more tokens and um, can often have negative consequences. So yeah, you usually want to pick a proper number of tools and reduce the number of extraneous ones if they're not going to be used very often or if they're not high value for most of your use cases. Um, and we have other videos on how to balance that and how to use LangGraph actually to be selecting tools. And um, with those other videos, and we have examples in the repo. All right, next comes the solver. So this is similar to the previous one. It executes the, uh, or it decides the final response based on the tool responses. So um, we can run that. And finally, the graph itself. Again, you have each node, there's a plan, tool, and solve. And then we say every time that we plan, we then go to the tool node. Um, this tool node, again, just goes through all of the plan in sequence and executes them. Um, we then have the solve node, which um, is always uh, traversed to from tool to solve. And then finally, we have this conditional edge, which says that if, again, so if there's a next step, or if there's no more steps left to execute, we'll go to the solve one, so we'll, we'll finish the loop. Um, otherwise, we'll continue to stay at this tool loop. So again, in picture form, it first goes to the planner node. This generates a task list that goes to the worker. And then the conditional edge defines whether it's going to continue to loop or whether it goes to here. And then it responds to the user there. All right, so we'll finally prompt our reboot agent with the task that we provided, which is to look up the hometown of the 2024 Australian Open winner. And while this is running, I'll pull up Langsmith just to show what it will look like as you're debugging this. So you can see it's streaming right now. And then you can look at the first LLM call, which is the, the planner call. Um, so it has the prompt here. And you see the tools that we've provided it. And you see the task, where it's the hometown of the 2024 Australian Open winner. It generates this plan, which seems to make a little bit of sense. So it first is going to search for the winner, and then it'll use the LLM as an extraction function, essentially, to take the winner out from the results. Again, the results are a little JSON list. It's pretty long. So this is actually an improvement that will give it just a couple words um, for the next function. Next one is the uh, to search for the hometown, and then give it this information. And then it says retrieve the hometown from the results. So again, extract from this search function. It seems to have that pattern down. Um, we'll do a brief refresh just to look at what other functions it's done. Looks like it did call the search engine there, and then called it again with the hometown, given the content equals this. Um, so we'll show the output. Uh, the hometown is Italy. Doesn't necessarily make the most sense. It looks like we're using 3.5 turbo. So we could probably get improvement with a better model um, or with better prompting here um, to really focus on the hometown there. Um, but you can see that it at least found some relevant information based on this. And using Linksmith, we were able to see some things that we could improve. So without wanting to take too much more time on this, a, a recap of this Rewu paper is that it improves on the plan and execute approach, the, the naive plan and execute approach, by allowing variable substitution. It was able to go and uh, use that sequence of, of steps with search and then extract without having to call the planner LLM again with this redundant step of, of agent scratch pad and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, in theory, it's able to save a lot of time and tokens in doing so. The problem this still has is that it still relies on a sequential step series of um, of tasks. We don't explicitly track the dependencies of each tool. You can add that. Um, and then all the tools are invoked only after the LLM itself completes its response. So you wait until the full generation is done, and then you execute the tools in sequence, and then you call the, uh, the solver. So all of this adds time in your execution. If a user is waiting for the response, it's not the best user experience. Um, the LLM compiler paper by Kim et al. sets out to address some of these limitations that we saw in the Rewu paper. Um, it's designed to speed up the execution of the agent 
by two main approaches. One, it streams tasks in the form of a DAG. Um, so each task it has, has the variable substitution there along with an explicit list of dependencies. So in those later search steps, it marks as it's dependent on the first one, for instance, and then we'll go there. Um, so you can be having some of these tools executing in parallel rather than all in sequence. That's going to save us a decent amount of time if each of these search operations is going to add up. Second, we're actually streaming the task output itself. Um, so as each token comes out, we check to see if we can then parse a new task from that streaming output. And as soon as that is available, we pass that on to the task fetching unit. This again saves us a lot of time because while the LLM, especially for a long plan, while the LLM is outputting more tokens, we can already start executing these earlier uh, tasks and, and it's saving the time overall. Um, so this can get us above some of the performance of, for instance, some of the naive parallel tool execution of OpenAI and um, the previous Planet Execute examples we reviewed today. Um, this task fetching unit will go into further detail later, but it basically uses multi-threading and will schedule a task as soon as its dependencies are met. Once all of these tasks are finished, the rest of this is basically the same as the other examples we saw. So we update the state with the task results and then we have this joiner, which essentially is a dynamic replanner that takes the results, the input, and all of that information and decides will it go um, respond to the user or is it going to de generate a replan operation? And then that will then go back to this task fetching unit there. Um, so again, we're going to all right, we'll set, set up Langsmith and install our dependencies here. I've already done so. Um, I wanted to add my API key for Langsmith so it can go to this separate project, um, the LLM compiler project, so we can really group our traces like that. Um, and then without further ado, we can define all of the different components of our agent. We'll start by defining the tools. In this case, we're gonna have both the search engine, which we're doing this Tavoli engine again, and the um, a, a math tool, which is you know, an ASD parser and, and, and and a calculator there. We use an LLM within the math tool since the outputs of search results may be unstructured and we want to make sure that we can structure it into specific floats. This is akin to what we saw in Rewu where having a separate LLM tool that it can call that would extract those results for us. Um, so we'll define those and you can see for instance, this calculator here, it's going to be outputting the results based on some of these things, even if there is misspellings and other things in the input. We has this optional context argument that the um, LLM or the planner can provide that allows it to pass on additional context from the user input that won't be available just by being passed in through the args or the outputs of other tools. The second one's the planner. This is mostly interesting relative to the other um, agents that we saw today in that the format permits streaming um, and it really focuses on the uh, on that. So it'll output the things that look like the Python uh, function invocation where it has the name of the tool and then parentheses and the arguments there. Um, I added in the keyword based arguments here so it's easier to parse into a dictionary and use that within our state. I created this additional planner, which has this branch that decides whether it should replan or whether it should not. And if it's replanning, it'll be doing some updates to the state just to make sure it's formatted correctly for the agent. Um, so again, this single function handles both the planner and the replanner from above. I'll define that. All right, so next up is the task fetching unit. And this, I think, is the most interesting part of this paper relative to the other papers we're reviewing today. It takes in a stream of dictionaries where each dictionary contains the tool that we're going to be invoking, as well as a list of dependencies. Each dependency is represented by a number, which is that index in the stream of tasks that you have um, emitted from the LLM. Importantly, the index is continued to be incremented across replans. So you can continue to reference some of the original tasks that were executed even after you've replanned. So you don't have to do redundant work in theory. I'll jump into the main function here. So this scheduled tasks component, again, you take this stream of tasks. So this is a generator of dictionaries as well as the state of messages. So if we're thinking about the state graph, the line graph state graph, it's tracking all the information about an execution within this list of messages for the chatbot. 
um, we get the observations from the messages because we uh, are then formatting all of the tool responses as function messages. So if this is a replanning step, then you can get all of the observations from those previous ones, format it in a nice dictionary so we can be looking up and substituting that here. After that, we're going to be starting this execution step. We want to be able to schedule this in a separate thread so we can continue to stream these inputs from the LLM in without impacting the overall runtime of the tools. We check if there's dependencies of the task and that all those tests, all those dependencies are not yet met. And if that is the case, then we'll schedule it as a pending task. And we'll go over what this means later. Um, otherwise, we can schedule it immediately. So we'll just schedule this um, directly. We'll call the tool. And then once that is actually ready, um, this is missing something here. Um, once that's ready, the results will be populated into the observations again. And um, the scheduled task can then check and then eventually be executed once they're ready. The um, schedule pending task here is basically a loop that checks for the dependencies of the task and we'll just sleep so it'll, it'll pull to see whether the, it can actually be executed yet. Um, the regular scheduled task, again, it invokes the tool and once it is actually invoked, then we will um, return that as an observation. If there's an exception in calling it, then we're going to return the exception here uh, within the list of observations. When you're executing the task itself, we try to resolve the arguments. So in doing that, we look for this syntax with a dollar sign for variable substitution. Um, there's some cases where it will use more of a, a code based like dot output or something in it. So we're handling an additional case there. And then we will um, look at the index that it represents. From that list of observations, we'll look up the um, observation there or the dictionary of observations. We'll get that from the index and then we'll return that there. So then all the arguments for the tool it can be multiple arguments to the tool um, will be resolved. Um, and so yeah, this is um, the way that we use variable substitution to let it actually generate the full DAG without having to do just incremental steps and recall planning um, there. So I'll run this. And the final, we'll see if it runs first. All right, so it ran. Um, and you can actually check Langsmith to see what the results look like. We'll wait for that until the final step just to um, get on with it. So the joiner is the replanner here. Um, this is a little less interesting. It's kind of the same as the previous steps. It takes in the uh, previous responses, and then we'll decide whether to replan or whether to output a final response. We're using function calling here just because it's a reliable way to generate structured output from you know, unstructured input using LLMs. Um, the joiner output, we will then format either into a system message if we want to be replanning, or we'll respond with the final um, AI message here. Um, so we'll format that to both so you can see what it outputs like here. And the final step is actually to orchestrate this with LangGraph. Yeah, cool. So you see the results and it decides that it's actually going to finish and says the temperature of San Francisco was mentioned, etc. Um, the graph is created with just these two nodes, really. It's a pretty simple one. Uh, since plan and schedule is all contained within a single runnable, um, runnable DAG, uh, you have the plan and schedule node and then the join node. And the anytime the plan and schedule is called, it will automatically go to the joiner, since that decides whether the um, loop should end or whether it should continue. And then finally, we will add this conditional edge from join and decide whether we should end or whether we should go back to the plan and schedule node. Uh, so again, the conditional edge has a function, and then the function outputs the strings. This is just a variable for the double underscore end string. Um, and these then uh, will correspond to different nodes in the graph or the finishing condition. So we'll compile it, and then ask it a simple question. So like, what's the GDP of New York? And now that it's running, I'll ask it some multi-hop and multi-step math. Uh, when it's running, you can see uh, in Langsmith, you can jump over and look at the results. Um, here, so you can, I, I ran this just a second ago, um, you can see what's the GDP of New York, and you can see the series of operations here. So we have the planner, it outputs, um, so this is again the first uh, result there, so it has totally search, and then it has um, this value, and then calls again, looking for uh, a replanning attempt to look at GDP of New York in 2023, um, because in the original one, 
it didn't get the most specific results that it wanted. And then it finally goes and it says it, um, it says it's provided in the search results, the New York has this. And so it says the, the GDP of New York in 2022 was 2.053 trillion. Um, again, we could provide additional information if we wanted to be more specific about which year or something like that. Um, the next question we had for it was a multi-hop question. Uh, let's go back here. So what's the oldest parrot alive? You can see the output of the plan. It has zero and two. It has um, the search for the oldest parrot alive. Um, and then it has average life status, bin of parrot, and then has the end. There's no variable substitution here. It's able to just do parallel fun uh, function calling, basically. But you can see both of these are called um, pretty quickly. And then after that, it calls the planner and it says that it's found the age of the oldest parrot, who's 83 years old, quite old, but it doesn't have the average life sign of parrots. Um, it was only able to get some other specific information, so it tries again. So you can see the replanner. Um, it then continues from where it left off in the task list and says average lifespan of parrot. You look it up, and then the replanner chooses um, that it's found the oldest one there. It says that um, it's not, they don't have the specific lifespan there, but it's implied that large parrots may live longer than smaller species. Um, so basically it's saying the search results weren't good enough, uh, both from the output here and from debugging with the trace, you can see the search engine actually should probably be tuned here for this type of question if we wanted to be able to respond well to this type of question. Uh, and that's really the way we'd want to be improving things. We want to improve the overall quality of this agent. Um, anyways, we'll jump back to the notebook. You can see that it's completed here. Um, you can see it also did a math problem, which we can jump to here as well. It did, again, this math chain a few times uh, in, in sequence there. So again, um, that's about it for the LLM compiler notebook. I think um, the key takeaway from this one is that whenever you're doing planning and you have variable substitution, if you do track the dependencies there, then you can actually start executing the tools before the uh, agent ends. And so this can overall optimize your runtime, save on tokens relative to the React agent style, uh, and improve the overall performance of your model. Um, I think all of these agents in summary are a step towards a more robust and more effective agent design if you want to be using LLMs to make decisions about how to execute tasks. Uh, and I think implementing them in LangGraph is pretty straightforward. I would actually recommend doing so yourself and maybe combining some of these different approaches, like taking maybe the um, Rewu or Plan and Execute style um, output from the planner and streaming it and using something like an LLM compiler executor to be able to doing it more eagerly um, and stream mixing it with maybe other um, design patterns that we showed throughout the LangGraph though as well. Um, so that's about it. Again, thanks again for watching this video. Um, feel free to leave feedback on the video and like or subscribe um, to share and follow other types of content like this so that you can learn more about how to create different agents, um, both for production and for experimental use. And finally, if you want to sign up for Langsmith, feel free to go do so at smith.langchain.com. Um, we no longer have a wait list, so you can go ahead and get started debugging your LLM workflows immediately. And um, thank you all and hope to see you again.